Hello my dear friends, uh, welcome back to my course. So today we have a second lecture and our conversation will be about uh, World War I, which is directly related to the topic we did last time. Remember what we did last time? The topic was imperialism. And at the very end of the last conversation we discussed um, so-called imperialist wars tiny teeny tiny wars some of them were not teeny tiny some of them were big wars some of them were tiny wars which um, were conducted by different groups of uh, <clears throat> powerful industrial nations uh, among them European nations and Japan and the United States over the lands that didn't belong to them okay remember England and uh, so-called the Boers were fighting over South Africa, Japan and Russia were fighting over <clears throat> northeastern China, uh, France and Germany almost attacked each other in uh, Morocco, Western Africa, and finally uh, the United States um, were caught in this war with the Spanish Empire over Cuba and Philippine Islands. So the point I want to make that uh, the whole world was divided, redivided, uh, big industrial nations were fighting about resource, over resources, <clears throat> over the influence, they wanted to have colonies, they wanted to expand their power, and uh, new um, small nations were trying to imitate the big nations like Germany, like France, like England, like the United States, they also wanted to become industrial nations, and soon um, many aspiring nations and old industrial nations, they were involved in the big fight. At first it was small fights, and now uh, in 1914 they became involved in the big, big fight over the world, over the influence, over resources who would dominate the world. And uh, that's the story of the First World War, when everybody was involved in this worldwide fight fight that nobody could avoid. So everybody was involved, even people from remote corners, like such exo exotic places like Papua New Guinea or some Pacific Islands, they were involved too, Latin American countries, African countries, nobody could stay away. So uh, World War I became the first uh, example of a total war, okay? So welcome to this topic, so let's begin. <clears throat> World War I was uh, fought from uh, 1914 to 1918, okay? Um, I would like to uh, make a major point today in this lecture. It was not only fight over who would dominate the world and eventually we have uh, two uh, groups of countries, two alliances, two alliances of countries fighting each other. But it was also about the rise of a big militant state, okay? That was a major consequence of this war that in the way, during and in the wake of the war, we have uh, a big powerful state been empowered, been um, elevated, okay, and the human life, human individuals became uh, unworthy or were forced to be part of a, a big group, okay, and a, a big collective, a big state, these were the major things, the most important things. Why? Because the war itself um, promoted this ideal of collectivism, uh, martial ethics, okay, mobilization, consolidation, okay. So when you have an emergency situation, um, especially the war, okay, like for instance, right now we have a, a emergency-like situation, and of course the government immediately jumps and said, "Oh, let's treat it as a war. We have to be mobilized." So like. Uh, if you uh, <clears throat> try to do something on your own, so you might be arrested or something. Anyway, naturally, we have this uh, uh, worship of the state, worship of uh, 
martial ethics, you know, uh, commanders in chief come and make orders, and uh, of course, nothing can be done. I repeat, it's a natural thing that happens in time of crisis and the time of war. But um, World War I was a worldwide crisis. Of course, uh, it, it cannot be compared with what we have right now. It's uh, World War I was the war that uh, led to the loss of uh, <clears throat> almost 20 millions of lives, okay? Plus, uh, in the wake of this war, there was a big epidemic of flu. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, that's a very a lot of similarities only in the diff on a different scale. And uh, un uh, it's, uh, uh, unfortunately, millions of people died because nobody, of course, uh, at that time observed any sanitary rules, any norms. Uh, it was ignored. But again, uh, the major loss was the human life uh, in the course of the war about 20 million and uh, since the w society uh, all countries entire society on the globe was weakened by this war so epidemic hit people and about uh, uh, between 20 and 30 million people died unfortunately in the uh, during and in the wake of the war 1918 so-called epidemic of Spanish flu but anyway we're not going to talk uh, about epidemic our topic today is the war okay First, let me remind to you how this war started. Okay, what triggered this war? Formally, the war was sparked by uh, an assassination. Okay, there was a tiny area in southeastern Europe. Okay, if you want to see it on the bigger map, so uh, there was a tiny area called Serbia. Okay, Serbia and uh, parts of Serbia were owned by Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Serbians, like big European nations, wanted to be together. They said all Serbians should be together and give us this piece of land. We don't want our brothers and sisters being here in Austro-Hungary. But Austro-Hungary said, no, we don't want it. So there was a conflict and a terrorist group, terrorist group uh, of Serbians uh, attacked uh, so-called Archduke Franz Ferdinand, uh, Archduke. It's um, a person who was to succeed um, power after an emperor died okay, in Austria-Hungary. So his title was Archduke. He was a relatively young guy. So he was killed. The successor to the throne of Austria-Hungarian throne was killed. And it, of course, upset Austro-Hungarians and they said we need to chase these terrorists and they decided to cross the borders of this small country but Serbians were scared and they didn't want they didn't want let to let Austrians to come and chase these terrorists whom they supported Serbians were um, Greek Orthodox and they appealed to their big brother Russian Empire which was also Greek Orthodox, okay? And they speak similar language. So Russia decided to declare partial mobilization. So they come to help Serbians, okay? And now Austria-Hungary became scared. So what Austria-Hungary did, <clears throat> Austria-Hungary came to Germans, German Empire, and said, help us against Russia, because look, this small Serbia asked this big elephant called Russia, and now we are scared. So Germans said, yes, we will help you, okay? And now Russia was scared, because Germany and Austria-Hungary together, they were more powerful, because Russia, don't forget, it was um, um, a semi-backward country, which uh, just started to mobilize, to industrialize herself. So it was not yet a powerful country. It did not have yet a powerful industry. It was a peasant society. It was an agricultural country, which did not have yet a powerful industry. Okay. So now Russia decided to go to France because France and Russia were connected by a peace treaty to mutual help. And Russia asked France, can you help us against Germans? And since French didn't like Germans anyway because they clashed with Germans over Morocco and Africa and other parts of Africa. 
and in general they had wars remember germans when they were uniting themselves in 1870 germans um, invaded france and defeated france so uh, french people wanted revenge and french government said yes we are going to help you russians but now germans and austrians so don't laugh at this germans and austrians were scared because together russia and france were more powerful so they go to ottoman empire turks remember ottoman turks seljuk turks who wanted to create a powerful muslim empire in the middle east and remember uh, russians and turks the, there was a lot of bad blood uh, between them okay <clears throat> A lot of bad blood okay so here's the ottoman empire they clashed over uh, black sea who would dominate the black sea they clashed over the crimean peninsula they fought wars since the 1700s so anyway turks joined austrians and germans but now russians and french became scared so france asked england because they had the mutual treaty France and England about mutual help. Come and help us, English. So England comes to help France and Russia against Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Ottoman Empire. And soon, soon we have. Um, let me show. You. Soon we have uh, these two groups of countries that were ready to fight each other over who would dominate Europe and the rest of the world. See the. Um, countries which were colored, uh, which are colored in green here, they were called uh, allied powers, or so-called entente. Entente, it's a French word which means allies. Okay, so they were nicknamed entente, which means allies. The other group of countries, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and uh, Turkey, Ottoman Empire, they were nicknamed central powers because they were in uh, in this in Central Europe. Okay. So we talked about immediate causes of the war, okay? So I mentioned this, it was this spark, assassination of uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, uh, a guy who was to succeed the crown. So he was killed and that's what provoked the war. Um, and here's something that I mentioned in the, in the beginning, just for your information. Um, uh, ground causes of uh, ground causes of the war world war war it was nationalism and imperialism okay it was the competition among major industrial powers a desire to divide and redivide the world okay who would dominate the world who would control resources who would control colonies and i want to make a note of these small wars which uh, provoked this big 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 war okay <clears throat> So here on this uh, slide, you will see this, uh, again, what I described earlier uh, a couple of minutes ago, how these uh, coalitions of countries were shaped, how they were formed. All right. So the first major, the first major uh, point is that World War I uh, was uh, a total war, total war, okay? Originally, when countries, different countries, uh, involved, uh, became involved into this big fight, there was expectation both among central powers, Germany, Austria, Ottoman Empire, and among so-called allies, England, France, Russian Empire, the expect expectation was that the war would last only four, maybe a little bit more, four years, four and a half years, oh, I'm sorry, the war would last a few weeks. A few weeks. That was the original expectation. But in the reality, as I emphasized here on this slide, the war lasted for more than four years, from 1914 to 1918. And as I emphasized, both civil, it was a total war, both which means. Again, the definition of the civil uh, total war means both civilians and the military became involved. People from colonies became involved too. Okay. By the way, I purposely picked up these images to show you why. Because I wanted kind of to dramatize this point that it was the total war that involved not necessarily Europeans, but people from colonies. For instance, on this picture you can see 
an uh, African from Western Africa who was recruited to fight um, for France against Germans. Here on the second picture, you can see so-called SICK, S-I-K-H, SICK soldiers. SICK were um, uh, Hindu slash Muslim minorities. They practiced this uh, like a... Uh, uh, <clears throat> combined religion, you know, Hindu, Muslim, minority in northern India, they were excellent warriors, so they were recruited by the British also to fight against um, against Germans. And Germans did recruit also some Africans from uh, Tanzania to fight against uh, the English, okay. Um, World War One also is called uh, trench warfare. Why? Because the original expectation that um, it would be the war that um, uh, involved armies that would march like in old times uh, we know this um, cavalry attacks uh, each other uh, drums were uh, pe uh, people were beating drums armies were marching like engaging each other it didn't happen and i will explain to you why it didn't happen okay in reality it uh, escalated um, into so-called trench warfare. Neither side could prevail. Neither side could prevail. And soon in Europe, in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, they dug trenches and neither side could move. Okay, They tried everything, but neither side could move. People, soldiers lived in trenches. Soldiers uh, were shooting at each other. But all kinds of attacks uh, from each side were... Uh, stopped why they were stopped because of this okay because of this for the first time in um, world history um we have uh, the war that uh, engaged a lot of tax it was the war of technology okay that is why neither side could prevail because both sides used a bunch of technological inventions invented during the industrial revolution okay for example, here just I gave you a few images to show that the, the, the tanks were used, radio stations were used, or next slide you can see there's um, uh, heavy guns were used, airplanes were used on a, on a wide scale, uh, zeppelins, okay, machine guns, machine guns for the first time on a mass scale, okay. Um, and another deadly weapon was used in invention of technology, poisonous gas. Poisonous gas was used on a wide scale. And in fact, it was so deadly that um, uh, on some occasions, hundreds of thousands of people were killed on both sides. For example, in um, 1915, in French, on Somme River, S-O-M-M-E, Somme River, um, the Germans spread the poisonous gas over the French troops, French and English troops, but the wind brought the uh, gas back and uh, both German soldiers and the English and French soldiers died. So about 200,000 people died literally in a few days. Now, by the way, that is why um, poisonous gas was never used in a combat situation during the Second World War, because no matter how evil, evil Hitler was, so he never dared to do it because it was dangerous not only for the enemy, but also for your own troops. Uh, so we have here this, um, a new image of a soldier wearing a gas mask. So this kind of apocalyptic notion, you know, right now, for instance, in so-called mass uh, steampunk style, you know, we, in the subculture, where uh, images of horror, apocalyptic images are glorified. We have a lot of uh, this uh, gamers, uh, uh, people who are obsessed with this dark imagery. They kind of um, um, romanticize these images of uh, First World War and this image of a gas mask is currently popular. It's called steampunk. But at that time, people did live through this. And of course, it was the horrible reality when thousands of soldiers for the first time had to put on these gas masks and it not always saved them because some gas attacks were so deadly that people just died.
And by the way, this the would-be dictator of Germany, uh, Adolf Hitler, he was uh, also uh, poisoned during one of these attacks. He was poisoned by, um, I think, French gas, poisonous gas, and he recuperated in, um, uh, in a hospital and became mad, and eventually the rest is history. So we're going to talk about Hitler as well, okay? <clears throat> So uh, this war was uh, actually a war that ended in a mass slaughter because neither side could prevail. It's uh, the original expectation that um, somehow it would be somehow it would be over in a few weeks it did not materialize, and that is why we have millions of deaths when people were wounded and dying in trenches from poisonous uh, blood from. Uh, blood poisoning, uh, bleeding to death, or dying. And a lot of people, by the way, died from, dys from dys dysentery, okay, diarrhea, from typhus, and eventually the Spanish flu. And Spanish flu, by the way, um, was sparked in two places. Um, in northern France, where uh, a bunch of... Um, thousands of English soldiers were crowded in the same crowded spot and they lived near pigs, you know, slaughtering pigs, cooking these uh, pig meat. And eventually this uh, virus, um, flu virus, which as you know, breeds when uh, people and animal interact with each other, like current uh, virus uh, emerged from this Wuhan where people were slaughtering and eating these exotic animals, uh, bats and every and other animals. Anyway, this um, <clears throat> Spanish flu uh, was sparked in the northern France and also in Kansas, where uh, there were army barracks where thousands of soldiers were drafted for U.S. Army to be shipped to Europe. Uh, they lived in a crowded space, also close to domestic animals, uh, slaughtering some of these animals, uh, butchering them, cooking them, and uh, the virus sparked and eventually, as I said, killed uh, more, uh, between 20 and 30 million people. So, um, a lot of victims, a lot of death, horrible, horrible thing, okay. Males, male population was... the. Um, disseminated in france more than 20 percent of male population was slaughtered literally slaughtered okay and um, in england uh same number between 15 and 20 percent of male population was slaughtered in russia even more in fact russia suffered more than any other country um in russia 10 million people were killed as a result of this uh, first world war because russia was not well equipped to uh, fight the modern war, so uh, Germans had more modern war um, war equipment, so they were able to slaughter more Russians. When the male uh, uh, population was uh, literally drafted, was to go to the army, and uh, after uh, hundreds of thousands of males died in trenches, more people were drafted. So, and eventually, there was nobody at home to work to perform such uh, quote unquote male jobs of a postman, truck driver, working in factories, so there were not enough males. So that is why, and you can see it on this picture, that is why we see this new practice emerging uh, in the life of Western countries where women were drafted. Uh, in some countries, women voluntarily went to work. Uh, on factories uh, either to make uh, uh, money or because they consider uh, this as a, their patriotic duty. But in some countries they were drafted, like in England, a lot of women were drafted to work in factories or in agriculture. Okay, So that is why we have this um, breakdown of, uh, further breakdown of these traditional ways when women were expected to stay at home with kids, and that was it. Okay, remember the first time when this um, a traditional practice was uh, partially undermined was in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Remember, we talked about these textile ladies, young women who had moved to cities to work in textile factories. Okay, that was the first breakdown of traditional society. In the second time when this traditional society 
where there were so-called male, female occupations. Um, uh, this type of society was literally destroyed. It was the First World War when women on a wide scale uh, went um, uh, to work on factories, started uh, when they started doing so-called performing, when they started performing so-called male occupations. So many women started to serve as um, a mailman, they started to drive trucks, they worked in factories producing guns, cartridges, and so forth and so forth. And by the way, um, because of their changing economic roles, women dramatically raised their status. Okay, before they were like in the backstage, in the backyard, okay, like invisible. But now they were so visible, not only visible, but they became a very important as, a, as an economic force. Okay, that is why uh, it was natural that um, at the very end of the First World War, finally, finally, women were granted full citizenship. Remember, before we talked about so-called uh, Atlantic revolutions, uh, English Glorious Revolution, then American Revolution, then French Revolution, which gave rise to more and more and more people, but they never, neither of them gave rise to women. Remember, in the British uh, Revolution, uh, 1688, only 4%, about 4% were enfranchised, received rights. During uh, the American Revolution, only white male property owners were became full-fledged citizens. So the rest of the people, including women, were not uh, citizens, were not considered citizens. Even the French Revolution that went further, which gave rights to all males, finally at some point stopped and decided not to give rights to uh, women because at that time they were not ready for this. But now... Finally, entire society in the West, I'm talking about the West, because uh, in other parts of the world, women were still treated as um, uh, <clears throat> as a secondary, as, as non-citizens. They had no rights, okay, like Middle East, China, and so forth, and so forth. It was only in Europe when finally, in, uh, at the end or in the wake of the war, women received full citizenship, which means they could testify in courts, they could um, uh, vote uh, to elect and be elected, so it was a good thing, okay? <clears throat> As I said, neither, neither side could win, neither side could win, okay? There was a stalemate, and the first victim of the stalemate was the Russian Empire, because Russia was a... Um, Russia was a... Uh, uh, backward country, peasant country, which did not have a powerful industry, so she uh, could not she could not stay in this war. Soon the Russians ran out, ran out of guns, ran out of cartridges, uh, ammunition, ran out of food, because Russia mobilized 15 million peasants, and Russian agriculture remained without male workers. The primitive Russian agriculture remained without workers, and... Um, she could not be in the war. Russia could not be in the war. I will give you one example that will show you how uh, bad it was for Russia. When peasant uh, soldiers, peasants were recruited to become soldiers, especially uh, as late as uh, uh, 1917, uh, when they reached the trenches, uh, they asked their officers, give us guns, and the officers usually told them, wait, when one of your comrades uh, could be killed, that's when you would pick a, pick up a gun, so horrible. So the R Russian troops, Russian army didn't have enough guns to give all uh, its soldiers. So um, soon in the Russian 1917, people revolted against the government, against the emperor, because um, people didn't have enough food, because supply lines were disrupted. Everything was uh, delivered to feed the soldiers and uh, the people who lived in cities remained without uh, food. Uh, there was no bread, for instance, in the capital of Russia, St. Petersburg. Uh, there, was no, there was no bread and women in the spring of 1917 went, on went to demonstrate against the government and when uh, the Russian Tsar sent the troops against them, troops refused to shoot at them. Instead, troops joined these women, and soon 
the Russian Tsar was deposed. Okay, so he had to abdicate, and in Russia, um, a provisional, so-called provisional government took over, but the fact of life was that this country was out, was out, even though uh, this provisional government said, we are going to continue the war, in reality, uh, the population of the Russian Empire decided to stop the war. Soldiers started uh, leaving trenches, hugging German soldiers, refusing to fight, refusing to uh, listen to the orders of the officers. And the Russian front, Russian front collapsed. So German became empowered, and soon Germany occupied uh, uh, the entire European part of the Russian Empire. Okay. So Germany was inspired, and uh, at this point, England and France, uh, they were in panic. What to do? What to do? And that's when they, uh, England, appealed to the United States, to the United States, come and help us. And since the United States and England were connected by uh, numerous um, uh, linguistic, cultural, uh, uh, political ties, so soon the United States uh, decided to come and help England because there was a fear that Germany and Ottoman Empire and Austria-Hungary could uh, defeat France and England. Uh, but the United, it was hard for the uh, U.S. population to be engaged into this war. Why? Because at that time, Americans didn't like to be involved in the European life. They believed that whatever was going on in the old world, it was the job of Europeans or whatever, Asians, Africans, we don't need to be involved. So we have to take um, care of uh, the Western Hemisphere. And if you studied U.S. history, you remember that this notion, uh, this isolationist notion of the Americans about uh, not being involved in the life of the old world, was best of all expressed in so-called uh, the Monroe Doctrine, the Monroe Doctrine of 1824, when U.S. President Monroe said, "You Europeans do not in uh, do not uh, mess with the Western Hemisphere, and we are not going to mess with you. So whatever is going here was going on here in uh, North America, South America, it's our business." Okay. And you Europeans don't come here, don't, don't come here. And we are not going there either. I mean Europe, okay. So uh, Americans didn't want to get involved. So that is why for uh, a progressive president Wilson, a democratic president, it took a lot of effort to force, literally, to force Americans to be engaged into this war, okay. How, what happened and how did he uh, engage uh, uh, Americans into this war. First of all, Germans were stupid enough to send the cable to the president of Mexico asking um, a Mex Mexican president to help them in this war. In exchange, they promised to help Mexicans to return New Mexico, Texas, um, Colorado, Utah, and California that had been taken by Americans from Mexico during uh, the Mexican-American War of uh, 1848, okay? And this cable was intercepted by the English intelligence services and soon uh, all major newspapers in the world were published uh, with these editorials that said, uh, German government wanting to instigate Mexicans against U.S. or secret cable uh, of uh, Germans to Mexicans, you know, something like this. In history, it became known as Zimmerman Telegram. Zimmerman Telegram. Zimmer, Zimmerman was um, a German um, uh, highly positioned bureaucrat in the German uh, foreign ministry who sent this cable that was intercepted by the English intelligence service. And the second thing was so-called um, uh, Lusitania incident. Lusitania was a tourist boat used by American tourists that was going to uh, Europe. But um, Americans frequently used um, uh, merchant boats and uh, tourist boats to deliver guns and ammunition to UK, okay, secretly. 
and the Germans found out about it, and they said, if you Americans are going to use um, regular tourist boats or merchant merchant boats uh, to load guns and ammunition to be delivered to England, we are going to torpedo them. And that's what they did with Lusitania, that was a tourist boat, tourist ship, okay? So that carried both tourists and guns for England. So it was torpedoed, um, uh, 120 Americans died, and that's what gave President Wilson an excuse to, involve in to get involved into this war, and he said, we cannot tolerate this. Uh, but some Americans still didn't want it. So they protested very hard, and in fact, some of, uh, of these protesters in the U.S., they were thrown into prison. For instance, um, <clears throat> at that time, American socialists were against this war, okay? So many socialists were thrown into prison, okay? And some regular... Uh, uh, people who did not belong to any parties who were speaking against the war. Okay, um, soon U.S. Uh, introduced the military draft. One million people were mobilized. And by the way, remember I mentioned that's when this uh, epidemic of Spanish flu em um, <clears throat> emerged because in Kansas there were uh, thousands of. Uh, uh, <clears throat> draftees were congregating with each other and they were staying around animals and that's where the Spanish, uh, one of the places where the Spanish flu flourished. But soon uh, one million U.S. soldiers were mobilized and uh, sent to Europe to fight against Germans, against Germans, Austrians and Turks. Okay, And the march of hardware was also sent to Europe. And by the way, uh, during these um, ocean voyages, a lot of U.S. soldiers died. So we don't usually mention this. They died from either from this epidemic disease called Spanish flu, and they were thrown and into the open sea, or they died from uh, diarrhea, in case uh, typhus. A lot of uh, um, epidemic diseases, minor and big diseases were going around. So a lot of these people uh, died before they even reached the trenches of uh, Europe. Okay, And uh, of course, when U.S. hardware, U.S. military force came, German, uh, German troops were not able to resist because they were exhausted on uh, like fighting Britain and France. It was one thing, but to fight uh, like hundreds of uh, thousands of American soldiers in these uh, new airplanes, new tanks, new guns, that was impossible. So it was just a matter of time when Germany, Austria, and the Ottoman Empire would admit they uh, could not uh, fight anymore. And Germans finally had to surrender. Surrender, okay. Why Germany had to surrender? Because Austro-Hungarian Empire was the first to pull out. Okay. After this, Germany could not stand in the in the war on her own, and they uh, surrendered. Uh, Wilson said that Austria-Hungary Empire was followed by the Ottoman Empire, and soon Germany was alone. So they couldn't. Germans could not fight alone. But President Wilson stepped in and he said, oh, let's not penalize Germans. Everybody's responsible. Sounds good. Okay, so he said, we don't need to uh, blame anybody. Yes, Germans were defeated, but let's do peace without winners. Okay, and he also declared uh, self-determination self for all nations. So which means uh, these... Uh, different nationalities that before belonged to the Russian Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Austro -Hungarian Empire, and uh, the Ottoman Empire, they had to be granted an independence, nationhood and independence, because uh, many people around the world wanted to become independent nations. Remember, nationalism became popular at first in the most advanced industrial countries, and then minor nations wanted to replicate uh, these examples that powerful industrial nations okay so and it was done so small nations in eastern europe they were given independence 
Uh, we have new countries in the wake of World War I, such as Bulgaria, Romania, Austria, Poland, okay, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Finland, okay, new countries. But unfortunately, the original promise not to punish anybody for this war, no winners, that was the call, no winners, it was violated, it was grossly violated, okay. Since Germany was defeated, it was easy for UK and France to have their way and soon they started to blame Germany. And since Germany surrendered, they blame her for initiating this war, okay. Uh, on top of this, UK and France decided to humiliate Germany. Okay, they required Germany to pay a redemption money, okay, so reimbursement for the damage that was inflicted on UK and um, on France. But unfortunately, nobody paid Germans for their um, damage inflicted on Germans. And to intimidate Germans, to force Germans, uh, intimidate Germans into submission, uh, in 1918, um, England and France declared a food blockade, food blockade. So Germany was literally blockaded from all over, okay. It was forbidden to, um, uh, sh uh, to, sh uh, to deliver food to Germany. It was forbidden to sell food to Germany and all companies or merchants that tried to bring and sell food to Germans, they were uh, deterred, uh, they were either arrested, they were prevented from trading with Germans. As a result of this food blockade, 400,000 Germans died. I repeat, 400,000 Germans died in 1918-1919, okay? Among mostly children and women, civilian population, okay? And that became a huge humiliation, a huge... Um, trauma for Germans. Why do I emphasize this? It later became for Hitler one of his obsessions that Germany should take over lands, agricultural lands from other countries to use these lands to provide uh, uh, food independence for Germany. Okay? That is why uh, Hitler and his allies later in 1930s, 1920s, 1920s, 1930s started to plan seizure of lands in Eastern Europe from Ukraine, from uh, Russia, from Poland, okay, seizure of these lands to uh, grab them and to use them to make Germany independent in terms of food. Because Hitler was afraid that the same thing could be repeated again, that um, somebody would make a decision to isolate Germany and since Germany always dependent on uh, food shipments, on delivery of grain, because she didn't have enough resources, uh, didn't have enough agricultural lands to feed herself. So this goal later became to do so-called uh, Lebensraum. It's a living space. So later Germany uh, set out for herself the major goal in 1930s when Hitler came to power. I'm jumping ahead here, but I need to emphasize this, okay? because we are going to talk about it, <clears throat> okay? So, uh, uh, this damage was done when Germany was intimidated into submission and 400,000 people died from hunger and it became a huge trauma for German population, which contributed to the rise later, to the rise of German nationalism and this de decision to revenge, okay? So, Germany was humiliated uh, in, in, uh, in this case, I would like to uh, stress that Germany was imposed this uh, peace treaty in 1919. In Paris, German delegation was invited and they were forced to sign a peace treaty. And this peace treaty said that Germany, Germany was the country that was responsible, responsible for initiating this war, which was, which was not fair because everybody was responsible. It was just the fight, the general fight over 
the world and attempt to divide and redivide the world. So Germany, like everybody, was guilty in this case. But um, she was, since she was um, defeated, she was chosen as a uh, the major scapegoat, and this peace treaty was imposed on Germ on Germans. They had to admit that we are the ones, we are the guilty side. And of course, it made Germans angry, and um, defeated Germans were not even invited to uh, this table where uh, the negotiation table where uh, France, England. Italy, United States were sitting and discussing this peace treaty. They only were invited in uh, at the last moment when they wrote the treaty and said, now you can come in, but you have to sign this treaty. And you are not allowed to discuss the terms of this treaty. Okay, You are not allowed to discuss. So they're, they're unfair. <clears throat> so uh, what came out of the negotiations, again, I forgot to put this word negotiations in quotation marks because there was no negotiations here. Negotiations was only among the winners, only among the winners. So Germany was not part of these negotiations. Germany also lost land, lost land. Germany lost, um, uh, see, before Europe was uh, looking like this, but after the war, uh, the map of Europe was uh, like this. See, Germany lost a chunk of land to Czechoslovakia, so-called Sudetenland. Germany lost um, uh, some lands here on the Baltic area. Germany also lost the northernmost part of uh, her land to Denmark. Germany also lost a very valuable coal mining areas here, okay, in Western Germany. <coughs> This area was declared demilitarized zone that was controlled by France, okay? <clears throat> and here you can see these newly created countries in Eastern Europe that were originally parts of the Russian Empire, Ottoman Empire, and Austro-Hungarian Empire, a bunch of independent nations, okay? By the way, um, and that's what created uh, a lot of animosity, okay, which later uh, opened the doors to the Second World War and uh, after the Second World War to the rise of national liberation movements in the Third World. Okay, Since President Wilson said, we're going to give nationhood and independence to all colonies, okay? but unfortunately it was what he said only covered the people who were parts of the former uh, colonies and possessions of uh, the Russian Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Ottoman Empire, okay, and most in Europe. As far as the Middle East, Africa, Asia, no colonies received independence, okay. Indians, for instance, who were helping uh, the English to fight against Germans, they expected that India would be would be uh, granted an independence, uh, but the Britain uh, Britain said no. We're not going to give you independence. Okay, Africans, no African colony received the uh, independence. Why? Because France and England mostly owned uh, African colonies, so they were not interested in this. On top of this, in the Middle East, the former Turkish possessions like Egypt, uh, Syria. Uh, what today we call Iraq, Lebanon, they were taken by Britain and France and um, to defy this President Wilson slogan to give each uh, country or former colony independence, they declared these areas former possessions of the Ottoman Empire, they started calling them mandates, mandates, okay, it's a special expression introduced by um, France and England, like a euphemism, like a, a phrase to cover up this uh, colonial domination of these countries. So they said that we're temporarily, it's like a temporary possession, we temporarily take over uh, these areas, these areas in uh, the Middle East, like uh, Kurdistan, uh, Syria, 
uh, Lebanon and Israel and uh, Egypt and Iraq is here okay and we are going to own them for a while but when we civilize and educate these people when they're when they are ripe ripe enough to be mature we might give them independence okay that was their talk that's how they justified their takeover so France took over Syria and Lebanon was called French Syria uh, this Kurdistan was taken over by um, the Brits uh, again the British or you know, English took over Israel here see is Palestine and also Egypt was taken over <clears throat> by the English also although formally they didn't call uh, it, uh, Egypt a mandate still Egyptian uh, king was uh, was controlled by the English government and also Iraq Iraq actually was a, <laughs> a country created by uh, the English out of uh, one of the possessions of uh, Ottoman Empire did not exist before they simply carved it here and called it Iraq and a bunch of people were included here okay Saudi Arabia was also a, a state a new state created in the wake of the war created by the British so formerly an independent kingdom but it was totally controlled by by the British okay <clears throat> so let's go back to the um, unequal terms of the uh, First World War. So Germany was unfairly blamed in initiating the war. Okay. Um, what we need to emphasize here is this uh, paragraph 231 of the Peace Treaty or so-called Versailles Treaty. Versailles, remember, it was the royal town in the suburbs of Paris built by Louis the 14th okay so that's where the Germans were invited to sign this unequal treaty so that is why sometimes it's called Versailles or P Paris treaty and the, the, the special paragraph of this treaty was uh, declared declared that Germany was to be blamed for initiating this war Another uh, part of this treaty said Germany was to repay damages for war to, to whom? To France and UK. $33 billion at that time. Now you can imagine multiplied by seven. Seven, six or seven. So that's how much money it will be in, in current money. Okay, it was a lot of money. There was no way for Germans. There was no way for Germans to pay. In addition to losing lands, let me show it to you. Okay, let me show it to you. See, again, Germany lost uh, part of land. See, it's even not shown here. To Czechoslovakia, to France, to Denmark, uh, to Poland here. It's a newly created uh, country. Poland took over a huge chunk of German land in eastern Germany. Okay, In addition to losing um, lands, Germans were forbidden to have an army. So they were, they were not allowed to have um, battleships. All their boats, military boats, were melted into iron. All their uh, heavy guns were destroyed. No tanks, no airplanes. Uh, the entire uh, Germany was not allowed to have a military draft. An entire German army uh, was, to, uh, was not to exceed 100,000 soldiers okay that was it 100 soldiers only okay the only uh, light arms rifles and that was it okay it's a huge humiliation so this bullet point uh, i would like to emphasize so german pride was wounded it was it was national humiliation they were humiliated okay and that was the major reason why later hitler came to power so um, sometimes uh, uh, some writers, popular writers or coffee table books or some uh, YouTube documentary movies, they claim that Hitler was such a powerful, charismatic person. He seduced the entire German nation, captivated it somehow, you know, they don't explain how, which was wrong, which is wrong because Germans themselves uh, wanted some kind of a dictator who would come and would save them from this uh, humiliation they 
experienced at the hands of the Western allies. Okay, so there was a, a lot of hatred among Germans, hatred of Western countries, uh, England, France, and US. Okay, this hatred of the West and the desire to uh, take revenge of these Western countries, a desire to eliminate these unfair conditions of the peace treaty. Okay, so that was a, a, a widespread a notion in the German society, both working class, farmers, middle class, rich and poor, a lot of them hated this um, uh, unequal peace treaty imposed on Germans. And naturally Germans um, hated the government, uh, the Republican government, which Western powers imposed on them, okay? See, um, Formerly, it was a good government. So Germany did receive, uh, in the wake of the war, a Republican government, a new constitution, the, the parliament, elections. But in the eyes of Germans, this new government, Republican government, constitution, were associated with the defeat, with military, with the military defeat in the war. Okay, so they thought that um, they were. Um, betrayed. In fact, Germany was not militarily defeated. It, it surrendered because she would not, she, German uh, military staff saw that Germany was not able to resist this overwhelming force of, uh, brought by Americans to Europe. Okay, so the, to save the country from total annihilation, they decided to surrender. But among the German population, there was this notion, this perception that Germany was betrayed, betrayed by somebody, but by some, uh, uh, by the left or by the Jews, and that is why the government, uh, socialist government that um, uh, presided over Germany in 1920s, in the eyes of um, half of the Germans, was associated with this government that was imposed on Germans by Western powers, okay? So Germans needed to, many Germans wanted to find, uh, to find some scapegoats to blame them in what, in backstabbing. So that is why this mythology, this myth emerged among the Germans that was later, later was milked, milked by Hitler. Uh, a legend about Germany being stabbed in the back. Okay, so who stabbed Germans in the back? And that's when they point, oh, it was this, um, the left, uh, the, 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 the social, social democrats, oh, it was the Jews, so they, they did it, that, the communists, okay. So that is why um, we have uh, in this um, uh, desperate situation, uh, Germany found herself in the wake of the war, we have the seeds of the future conflict, the seeds of the future tragedy that naturally led to World War II, okay? So that is why if it hadn't been Hitler, it could have been another person like Hitler who could come and fill the void because Germans did expect that these uh, humiliating conditions of the peace treaty be eliminated somehow. So they wanted to get rid of this uh, huge debt that was imposed on them. They wanted to get rid of this uh, uh, humiliating paragraph of the peace treaty. Okay, so uh, World War One did not bring the peace. World War One actually opened the doors to another war, and that's where I want to conclude my uh, today's conversation by making this con conclusion that World War One um, opened the doors to the Second World War. Okay. And no wonder that in 20 years, the whole world became engaged in another war. Okay. <clears throat> Let me show you something which is important, which is, was relevant for all countries, winners and losers, in the course of that World War I. Okay, it's like, like it's, it will sound like my conclusion, but it's a very important conclusion. Look at this poster. It's a um, it's an English poster, okay. That was um, directed a propaganda poster that was directed to mobilize people to fight against the enemy. 
what do you see on this poster okay on this poster you see a crowd of people who are marching in a column so you see here workers peasants civilian clerks you and in front you see the soldiers so civilians are joining the military marching all of them are mobilized all of them are united like a single force okay it's a very meaningful poster it tells us what was on the minds of people at that time so how they were looking at the world okay and that's where i come to the major conclusion of my conversation today okay step in into your place be ready to be mobilized accept this martial edit martial mindset accept mobilization naturally don't protest against this you know individual is nothing collective is everything so that's what was popular during the war and in the wake of the war okay see people got used to be mobilized and this obsession with mobilization uh dominated the minds of the people okay people got used to uh warfare economy okay at first it was justified by the emergency situation yes we have an emergency situation we have to fight against the enemy so we are ready to accept this um, martial uh, attitude so we are ready to be mobilized so people accepted food coupons okay so everybody was treated as a soldier radio soldiers of course on front lines were soldiers but even citizens who remained at home they were also viewed as soldiers citizens i repeat who remained at home women even children were also treated as soldiers who had to contribute to the victory okay so that is why during the war and in the wake of the war we have um, a big state a powerful state uh coming to dominate the life of the people so the governments in each country started to mobilize resources resources raw materials fuel everything was rationed everything was allocated this goes here that goes there food clothing everything was rationed so money literally becomes meaningless and uh, instead the people accepted rationing rations and here you can see by the way these coupons russian coupons which were uh, issued in uh, in the united states u.s uh, food administration issued uh, uh, food coupons okay wages rents and consumer prices were controlled okay you see you couldn't simply buy to go and buy uh, things in the store especially in uk in france in Germany and partially in the United States so some of the necessity major necessities were uh, ration okay for example you could receive only uh, two pounds of sugar each month okay so you can see here coupon sugar coupons and no more okay wages so people were expected um, to receive uh, fixed wages rents um, landlords were ordered to charge particular rents they were not charged they were not allowed to charge more and consumer prices were regulated which means businesses were not allowed to charge pe people more or less okay they were fixed prices and here um, look at this uh, uh, bullet point at the very end in the wake of the war uh, we can talk about um, so-called wretched wretched effect indirect effect Okay. In the wake of the war, government control of economy and life of the people increased, skyrocketed. So at first, people, something happens in our life, emergency situation. And we did and we do have emergency situations. I don't need to mention it so you know what is going on. But especially in the war, okay, during the war government um, exercises uh, big powers and comes to dominate chunks of economy and when the war is over uh, some uh, temporary things which people normally got used to accept suddenly become permanent and that's exactly what happened in the wake of the war four years of mobilization 
four years of governmental control, which were originally treated as a temporary thing, in the wake of the war became permanent, permanent, okay? Like uh, regulation of railroads, which was accepted during the war, after the war also, uh, by default, continued, okay? Like um, regulation of fuel prices also continued, or like paying taxes, uh, for example, in the United States, there was no income tax, okay, which uh, partially was introduced uh, in the United States in 1913, before the war. But during the war, uh, practically everybody was forced to pay income taxes, okay, it was justified by the war. And during the Second World War, it became the law that everybody had to pay income taxes. So I repeat, before... Uh, 1913 there was no income tax and of course in France um, in England uh, the prices were regulated and it continued very much uh, after after the war okay <clears throat> look at this picture what does it show us we see here uh, four major big men so-called big men on the one in the backstage, you see uh, Vladimir Lenin, the chief of uh, Russian Bolsheviks. Uh, we are going to talk about this communist regime in Russia. Here you can see Winston Churchill, who later became the uh, the Prime Minister of England. In the middle, you can see uh, FDR, uh, the would-be president of Russia, and uh, here you can see Stalin, who succeeded Lenin as the dictator of the Soviet Union. What does it mean? Why do I show you this picture? Okay. I want to show you, I want to uh, conclude my story by arguing that in the wake of the war, people not only got used to mobilization, to the power of the big state, but they also came to disrespect the constitution. They came to disrespect elections. They came to disrespect human rights. And instead, they started to embrace dictators, big, strong men, okay? Even democracies, even such powerful democracies where people got used to uh, democratic procedures like the United States, UK, France, were not immune to this, okay? Even there, we have such uh, powerful, strong men like FDR coming to dominate political life. As far as the rest of the countries, almost all of them, look at the map of Europe, almost each country in Europe in the wake of uh, uh, the First World War became a dictatorship. So constitution was not respected, elections were not respected, okay, human rights were not respected. Instead, instead people believed that there would be some great man, great dictator who would come and establish this powerful regime that would be like um, a great father helping them, okay, securing, uh, making them secure. And that, that's what was on the minds of the people, because people were taught how to march in a column, like this poster showed you, you know, people were taught for four years, for four years to march, okay, and they already forgot about uh, democracy, they forgot about constitution, and they were uh, ready to accept dictators, okay? Poland, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, uh, Yugoslavia, Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, Germany in 1930s, okay? You name them, Hungary, Romania, all these countries became dictatorships, all of them, all of them. And Soviet Union, Soviet Union became the first major dictatorship. And next time we are going to talk about the Soviet Union, uh, the first dictatorship. But again, all over Europe, practically all countries became dictatorships because people lost respect for the constitutional norms and for elections. Instead, they fell in love. Uh, Fell, uh, fell for these big men, big leaders. And that's what became a powerful trend 
uh, in the 1920s, 1930s. Okay. So let me finish at this point and uh, thank you for your attention. I will see you next week.